Let's pray together. Father, there are people in this text that have itching ears. That's not a good thing. They are heaping up teachers for themselves who will scratch itches that they should not have and are led away by various passions. And so I ask that as I preach, you would replace that carnal itch with a holy desire. A holy desire that welcomes the truth and does not walk away from it. And I pray that we would be given eyes to see the glory of Christ in this text and the glory of our hope and the wonder of the ministry and the centrality of the preached word. And I pray this now in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. It has always struck me as strange that my heroes, most of them, uh, people like the Puritans and especially Jonathan Edwards, almost never referred to themselves and their personal experiences in their preaching. You can read a hundred Puritan sermons and hardly know anything about the preachers. And surely if we preachers are going to err, that's the side to err on. Instead of excessive talking about ourselves, we should be talking about God. Because they knew that the power of preaching lay not in the experiences of the preacher, but in the God-breathed Word, the Word of God. And yet, how happy we are when God puts it in the heart of the Apostle Paul to lift the curtain on his life and his experience with God and his sufferings and in this case his dying. So in verses 6 to 8 that's what we have. We have Paul's experience and I'm thankful. As I would expect his experience is not the main point of the text. It's a subordinate argument for the main point of the text. That's what I would expect. That's, I think, the way it should be done. I learned that from him. And we know it's an argument and not the main point because it, verse 6 begins with four. You see that? hope it's there in your version. If it's not, get another version. <laughs> for or because I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. In other words, my death is at hand, Timothy. My course is finished. My reward awaits me just over the hill. Therefore, now you know this, don't you, that when you read forward and you find the word for, it's a because, it's a ground. And if you start reading backwards, an inference follows from that argument. So you read it like this. Verse 5, you should then, if you want to read backwards, since I have finished my course, since there's this great reward stored up for me, therefore... As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Now reading forward again, because, Timothy, I've done that. I fulfilled my ministry. I finished my course. I fought the good fight. And I want you to know, for the sake of yours, I'm telling you, fulfill your ministry. And I want you to know that I have fulfilled mine and I anticipate a 
reward, a crown, a wreath, a victor's wreath, or a race done and a boxing match won, I anticipate a victor's wreath, the crown of righteousness that will compensate for any cost in this life. And I want you to know that so that you will have an argument under your ministry to finish it. Fulfill it, Timothy. Fulfill it. That last phrase in verse 5, that's the main point of these eight verses. Fulfill your ministry. Don't, don't let suffering pull you away. And my argument, Timothy, is that I finished mine and I'm going to be rewarded megaton to make it up for whatever it's cost in this life to finish this ministry. A crown of righteousness can be put on my head. So, now we see the structure. I hope are you with me. The structure of verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. It's half the text we've got now structurally. Verse 5, the big main imperative, fulfill your ministry, including be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist. Those are specifics of the fulfill your ministry. And then an argument from his experience. I'm, I'm dying, Timothy. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be cut down here very soon. And I want you to know I finished my race. I fought my fight. I kept the faith. And a big reward is waiting for me. And there will be for you too. And everybody else who loves his appearing. So, Timothy, fulfill your ministry. See the argument? How it works? Now, verses 1 to 4. How do they fit into this flow of thought in verses 5 to 8? Verse 2 gives more particulars of what it means to fulfill your ministry, Timothy. And then verses 3 and 4 give another argument. So you got more specifics in verse 2 and another argument in verses 3 and 4 for why he should do it. Fulfill your ministry in these ways in verse 2 and then an argument. So verse 2, let's read verse 2. Preach the Word. There's a specific way of fulfilling your ministry. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. So more detail from verse 5. Unpacking all the ways that a pastor should be fulfilling his ministry. Unwearied preaching of the Word of God. And then the argument... In verses 3 and 4, totally different from the argument in verses 6, 7, and 8. The argument in verses 6, 7, 8 was, 7 through 8 was positive. Finish, complete, fulfill your ministry because I have and a great reward is in store for me. And there will be for you because you're one of those who loves his appearing. And this argument is totally negative. Not just reward is coming, great opposition is coming. And the way it works is, don't be surprised by it. I want, I want to tell you ahead of time, so you won't stop preaching. So you won't stop being urgent in season and out of season. That's the way the argument works. So let's read the argument. For, there's the key word again, if it's not there, new version. For... The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers. They go down the street, across town. They will accumulate for themselves itching, I'm sorry, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Okay, so here's the big picture. And if you wonder, where's verse 1? It's coming. Because it's a megaton 
in this text of explosives underneath preach the word. But let's get the big picture. Verse 5, fulfill your ministry. Particulars like, verse 5, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist. More particulars. Verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, complete patience and teaching, fulfill your ministry, stay at it, don't stop till it's full and you're ready to be poured out in death. And then, under this broad exhortation to fulfill your ministry come two arguments. A negative one, verses 3 and 4, and a positive one in verses 6 through 8. Timothy, stay at this word-saturated, gospel-laden preaching and teaching because time is coming when people will no longer accept it. Now, it may sound like a strange argument, but if, if I were a young pastor entering upon ministry with high hopes of having a, a fruitful ministry, and I didn't know that happens, I would be in jeopardy. So the way the argument works is Paul's telling him ahead of time to steal him so that when people walk out of his services who will not be itched by the way he's scratching and they go across town to be scratched with the itch they want scratched, he shouldn't be surprised. And he shouldn't quit. It's not his fault. That's huge. That's a big argument. And then the second argument, verses 6 through 8, press on in your word-saturated, gospel-laden preaching and teaching. Fulfill your ministry because I have fulfilled mine and I know what it cost me, Timothy. I finished my race. I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. And I promise you, Timothy, it's worth it. There is laid up for me a crown, a victor's wreath of righteousness. Today, it would be a gold medal hanging around my neck after I won 23 races or whatever. Or fought the judo. And so, Timothy, finish it. It may take you 30 or 40 years, just finish it, and finish it well. Now, should we stop here? Should we have benediction? And That's the text. That's the text. But I think to fill up the rest of my time, What I'd like to do is take each of the arguments and apply them a little more, all right? And then bore in on the particular of the big, broad, overarching point of fulfill your ministry, the particular that I think has most prominence, namely preach the word, and I'll argue why I think that, not just because I'm a preacher and like that idea. So, let's do that. Let's take the last argument first, 6 through 8. The reason this argument works for why he should fulfill his ministry is because Paul is persuaded that a great reward awaits those who do that. That's why he says, I've done it. I fought the good fight. I've finished my race. I've kept the faith, and, and now, Timothy, what happens to people like that is that they get this reward. So let's read verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, 
which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, last day. Now, he's just referred to a good fight that he's fought, and he's just referred to a race that he's finished. Therefore, I take the crown to be not the crown of a king or prince, but the crown of a race winner. It's exactly the same word as 1 Corinthians 9, 26, where Paul says, they, Olympians, run for a perishable wreath slash crown, same word, we for an imperishable. So I just think it's virtually certain that what he means by a crown is a victor's wreath as he falls over the finish line and then mounts the platform and has the righteous judge who never gets a millisecond wrong put the, the wreath of triumph on his head. And you get all those letters of Jesus to the churches, he who conquers. He who conquers, he who conquers. Same idea of hold firm to the end, conquer all the embattled unbelief of your life and you will be crowned. And the, the crown is called a crown of righteousness. Now what are we to make of that? Crown of righteousness. Whether that means we are rewarded for being righteous or whether the reward is final, completed, perfect righteousness. Both are true. Well, I've got texts. I won't read them to you. Both of those are true. You will be rewarded for righteous things you have done and the reward you get will include being made perfectly, sinlessly righteous. Hasten the day. So, which, whichever of those Paul is emphasizing, both are true, and we know we'll make it, to stir in the full picture, because we have learned from Philippians 3, 8, that we don't simply embrace a righteousness that comes from law, but the righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. There is imputed righteousness that we love, the doctrine of justification. I don't think that's in view here, but it's just always there in Paul underlying everything so that if I'm ever told you will be rewarded for righteous things, I know perfectly well I'm not good enough to go to heaven. I know I in myself would never pass muster at the last day because the last day criterion, perfection, God is holy, not going to let any sin into heaven. I could never make it, I know that. Therefore, I'm always at the bottom leaning on Christ, leaning on His righteousness, by faith, having his righteousness counted as mine, therefore perfection is a given as I approach the throne. But you know what the fruit of that is in your life? Change and good deeds. And God is not so unjust as to overlook that, Hebrews says. So, we stand on Christ's righteousness. We perform righteousness imperfectly, and we're rewarded for that with real, perfect, sinless righteousness, which we will enjoy forever and ever. What's the key here to attaining that crown? Something very beautiful and very, perhaps, surprising. Paul says in verse 7, what he's being rewarded for is I fought a fight. It was a good fight, a fight I should have fought. Secondly, I finished the race. My life was a race. My life was a fight. Sound familiar, anybody? If your life is not a fight, you're not a Christian. Simple. Simple. 
I have kept the faith. So my question is, what's the good fight? And he told us real plainly in 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. What's the race? It's the race of faith. I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, the race that I now run, I run by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. All of life is a running in faith and a fighting for faith and a keeping the faith. Every one of those is a faith thing. So what's He being rewarded for? A life of faith. It's not a hard life. Behold, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, from meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy. It's faith. Fight, run to believe. Paradoxical. It is a mortal fight, and it's a fight to rest. Strange fight. Awesome fight. It's a fight to rest in Jesus and trust Jesus and believe the promises of Jesus every day. Is that not our fight? If you're fighting the fight another way, you need to be helped to get the battle in order. When you get up in the morning, you're fighting to believe. When you go to work, you're fighting to believe. When you come home, you're fighting to believe. Believe the promises. I'll help you love your wife. I'll help you take care of your kids. I'll help you do devotions. I'll help you witness to the neighbor. I was driving, I was coming back on my bicycle. I did about a 10-mile ride this morning on my bicycle. And <laughs> coming down 11th, uh, right at 24th, where the small mall is. I saw three guys over there. And I went by him, and I, I don't, you know, the Lord doesn't talk to me. But more or less, he said, why don't you go talk to those guys? You ain't got any pressure. Noelle's not even here. She's at camp. So I circled around. I have no idea what I'm going to say. Walked back there. And I stopped. Here's these three Somali guys. And I said, hi. I think God just told me to come tell you. And then I shared the gospel with him. Why did I say that? What was I saying? That's not in my manuscript at all. And I can't remember what point I was, I was trying to make. Um, oh, yeah, fight the good fight of faith. Run the race of faith. Keep the faith. Fight for faith. Oh, that's it. That's it. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I'm driving, and I'm thinking, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do this, Lord. I don't, have no, I don't know what I'm going to say. I got about 10 seconds before I turn, and I just, mm. that's, that's called faith. Don't be afraid what you shall say in that hour, because the Holy Spirit will give you what you need to act in faith. Do what you're sensing God is leading you to do. A life of faith. Fight for faith. At that moment, the fight wasn't to be smart. The fight was to believe God is for me. He loves these guys. He wants to use me. That's a fight. The devil's got all kinds of lies. He's shooting at you at that moment. Why, that's so pointless. And belief says, get out of my hair, Satan. Okay, that's a parenthesis. Let me see if I can find my place. Oh. So what's being rewarded with the crown of righteousness? Answer, fighting the fight of faith, running the race of faith, keeping the faith, a life of believing Jesus, trusting the promises, banking on the one who's promised to help you be with you every day. That's the life of faith that's being rewarded. And then, and then he says, and this is to include Timothy to make sure the argument works, this crown will be rewarded to me, which is no encouragement to Timothy if it can't be his, 
And then he says, and not only to me, but to all those who... And then he didn't say, believe, or fight the fight of faith, or finish their race, or keep the faith. He didn't say any of that. He said, this crown will also be given to everyone who loves his appearing. Where did that come from? And surely we are to learn from this something about the essence of faith. Because if what Paul is being rewarded for is keeping faith and fighting for faith and running in faith, and then he says, and you too will be rewarded for, and instead of saying, faith, he substitutes love is appearing. What, what does that tell us? It tells us that right at the core of saving faith is wanting Jesus. Desiring Jesus. Craving fellowship deeper, longer, forever with Jesus. Faith is not simply acknowledging facts about Jesus. It is wanting His appearing. And you don't, you don't want somebody's appearing if you don't like them. You don't love them. Want them to be near. So, what gets rewarded with the crown of righteousness? You could say it in different ways. A life of faith or a life rooted in and driven by a passion to enjoy Jesus now and forever. You want Him. You want Him. Desire His appearing. Long for His appearing. So, don't think this is just for pastors because it's addressed to Timothy. He said, all who love His appearing. That's you. You will receive a crown of righteousness if you love Jesus. That's what the universe is for. Loving Jesus. Valuing Jesus. Treasuring Jesus. Desiring Jesus. I use those other words because so many people put do, do, do on love. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yes, that's not what love is. That's its result. Love is loving Him, delighting Him, craving Him, resting in Him, treasuring Him, valuing Him, counting Him more precious than my wife, my children, my job, my fame, my everything. That's what love means. And people that love Jesus get a crown of righteousness. And if I were to stir in the end of 1 Corinthians, let him be accursed who does not love the Lord. It's a big issue. Second argument in verses 3 and 4 maybe strikes even closer to home for congregations and not just pastors because it's talking about us, people, not just preachers. Verse 3 and 4, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And I could apply this to Jason Meyer as my Timothy. right? And the primary preaching minister of this church in, in about three months as he begins to stand behind the pulpit and I'll do other things until April. Don't be surprised, Jason, I could say, if as you begin to preach on the full, whole counsel of God and apply it to our culture, people will not feel scratched where they itch and will therefore walk away from the church. I would guess at a church this size, it happens every weekend. And the reason you just don't notice it is because they were only here for two or three weeks and then they're gone. 
However, I'm not going to apply it to Jason. I'm going to apply it to you because it's talking about you. Here's the warning I want you to feel as my loved Bethlehem. The root problem with the rejection of sound teaching and the wandering off into myths, the root problem with wandering away is not intellectual, but emotional and physical even. So notice, Paul does not say they won't endure sound teaching because of doctrinal confusion. He doesn't say that. He says they won't endure sound teaching because they itch. They itch. There's an itch that has to be scratched. It's in their ears. It can be scratched with words. And pastors can try to learn what the itches in the communities are and scratch them to keep the crowd. And Timothy wasn't scratching where they itched, and therefore he said, they're going to, they're going to find some other teachers, Timothy. So I'm pointing out that the problem is not intellectual first, it's itching. Or, look at the next phrase, he doesn't say they will accumulate teachers to sit there on ideas. He doesn't say that. He says they will accumulate teachers to suit their own passions. Whoa, what's that? What's that? What, how does teaching relate to passions? Well, under every false doctrine are bad desires. And ultimately, people embrace falsehood in their head to protect immorality in their soul and their body. So, Bethlehem, the fight that you're to fight is to replace the itch with, and the passions with, with desires and passions and another kind of itching that has to have truth. It has to have the Word of God. A, des a set of desires that makes you welcoming to truth, whether it's hard to hear or not. There's a, there's a whole complex of desires and passions and godly itchings that when truth is spoken, you say, oh, yes, 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 even if you have to cut off your hand and gouge out your eye. So that's my prayer for you that Jason will preach with faithfulness and that you will be given holy desires that welcome truth when it's spoken rather than saying, that's not scratching where I itch, I'm out of here. Bethlehem is a church that prizes preaching, and so we turn now to verse 2 for our last observation. Verse 2 begins, preach the Word, and I'm arguing now that among all the particulars of fulfilling Timothy's ministry, this one is pr prominent, preeminent. And my reason for saying that, let's, let's read it. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Repu re reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. My two simple arguments for why that's preeminent is number one, because it's listed first, but mainly because of the way it's introduced. Verse, um, verse 5, I mean verse 1, is simply explosively preparatory for the command to preach. Um, 
Bethlehem values preaching. There is a big, heavy pulpit. This is heavy. It takes three guys to move this. It sits at the front and the center of the room on every campus. That has nothing to do with me. And everything to do with the preeminence of the Word of God preached. And the root of it in history is this text, verse 1 and verse 2. All through history, preaching, preaching, not just teaching, not just discussion, not just all kinds of communication, but preaching has been prominent wherever the church has flourished in strength and power in its culture. And wherever preaching has been belittled, diminished, dismissed, experimented with, the church has languished, sometimes for centuries. And what I want you to see here is that for the sake of your future and Bethlehem's health is that that historical fact is not a fluke or a twist of culture, and it's not a Protestant bias. It is the fruit of biblical truth, and I would say the fruit of 2 Timothy 4, 1. Nowhere else in the Bible that I'm aware of is there a verse just like this. 1 Timothy 5, 21 comes close. But here, Paul introduces the command preach the Word in verse 2 with five preceding intensifiers. I don't know what else to call them. Phrases, clauses, words that are designed by God in the mouth of Paul to intensify and deepen and strengthen and heighten the command, preach the Word. So let's take them. One. I solemnly charge you. I add the word solemnly. It's there in some versions because the word is testify with an intensifier on the front of it, which means intensify solemnly. I mean uh, testify solemnly or charge solemnly. So he starts with that. I, I'm, I'm charging you. I'm testifying to you, and I mean for you to hear this in a solemn way, Timothy. Number two, in the presence of God. I'm not speaking in an ordinary way here, Timothy, with ordinary seriousness or ordinary authority. I'm telling you this, in the very presence of God. Here's the command, Timothy. Preach the Word, and it's coming from God in the presence of God. So, listen. Number three. And of Jesus Christ. Both the Father and the Son have great concern in this matter. I'm commanding you to preach. And we are standing right now, as I command you, before the throne of God, as the Father sits upon it, and the Son at His right hand, adding their solemnity and their authority to the command that I'm going to give you in just two seconds. Preach the Word. Number four, who is to judge the living and the dead? I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead? Of the hundreds of things he could have said about Jesus, why this? I'm standing before Christ and the Father, as I tell you to preach the Word, I'm standing before the, before the Christ who will judge the living and the dead, which surely means something like, when it comes to preaching, Timothy, we're not dealing with ordinary things. We're not dealing with simply earthly outcomes, like helping people get along. We are dealing with 
eternal outcomes as people face the judge of the universe. Whether they're dead or whether they're alive, they're going to face him, and you, in the light of that, preach which is why the office of the preacher is vastly more important than mayor or governor or senator or president. All they do is affect this world. You, preacher, deal in eternal things. Timothy, the one before whom you stand will judge the living and the dead. And don't you ever, ever let that far out of your mind as you stand behind that sacred place. Number five. And by his appearing and his kingdom. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom. This is a weighty intensifier. I solemnly charge you by the appearing and the kingdom of Christ. Timothy, I'm about to tell you the most preeminent command I have to give you about fulfilling your ministry, namely preach the Word. And I'm telling you in the light of the fact that He's going to appear and when he appears, he's going to be king, and this world will be his. And therefore, everything you've ever suffered for him will be worth it. And all those people who have left your church and wandered away into myths will be put to everlasting shame. Oh, Timothy, he's coming. He's coming. And when he comes, the world rulers who threaten your life right now will be as nothing. He will be king. Preach the word. That's just huge. I, I, I cannot escape that kind of intensifying introduction and draw any other conclusion from this text than preaching the word is preeminent in Paul's counsel to this young preacher. Just a few minutes left to say something about the content of the preaching and the nature of the preaching. Just a brief sentence each one. Verse 2, preach the Word. Now, what is that referring to? Well, just take away the chapter division. Shouldn't be there. These chapter divisions were added, you know, 1,600 years after the books were written. So just take it away. Pretend it doesn't exist, because it didn't. And now read it, verse 16, chapter 3. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing in the kingdom, preach that word the Scriptures. I'd love to go off on a tangent here about those today who, who are constantly stressing what we ought to be preaching in Scripture instead of stressing preach the Scriptures, but I won't. Preach the whole counsel and every text is profitable. I wish I had a hundred years to preach to you because I have left out so many things. I'm so thankful you are inheriting somebody who will just pick up where I left off. And I hope go to a lot of the places where I didn't go. I don't think I've ever preached a sermon in 32 years on the Song of Solomon. Shame on me. Best love story you ever read. Preach the Word. Preach the whole inspired, all profitable Bible. Last, what is preaching? <laughs> In two minutes. Jason's writing a book on that. Did you know that? He'll publish a book next year on preaching. I just think that is incredible and wonderful. What is preaching? The word here, preach, is the word 
herald. Herald. It's not teaching. It's not conversing. It's not sharing. It's heralding. Heralding before there was internet or television or radio or telephones or telegraph was what a town crier did to bring messages, for example, from the king. And it would sound like this. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. And the people would start to gather. They know that's the voice. That's the herald. The herald standing in the town square. Hear ye, hear ye. He'd take his scroll. The king has a message for you from the royal scroll with the imperial seal. All of you who have hated the king, belittled the king, conspired against the king, are hereby instructed and invited and compelled by the king at cost of your life to appear before his representative and lay down the arms of your rebellion. And if you will lay down the arms of your rebellion and you will swear fealty to your king, he will, because of the sacrifice of his son, on that day, pardon all your treason and all your discountenancing of his glory. And at a time appointed by his counsel, he will come to you and he will live with you and he will adopt you into his family and you will receive every conceivable blessing in his treasures. Thus saith the king. That's heralding. It's not teaching. Oh, it's got teaching in it. We call it in Bethlehem expository exaltation. It's a preacher loving what he has seen and being so thrilled with it, he just, do you see what the king has for you? So, Bethlehem, may the Lord preserve the faithfulness of the preaching in the ministry of Jason Meyer. You should be praying that. And add this to your prayer. May the Lord preserve your faithfulness, your faithfulness, as you love the preached word. Nothing can replace it. There is much more the church is, much more the church must do and be. Preaching is indispensable. And it's not about me or Jason or this big piece of wood. It's about the God-breathed book. Heralded. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the book and your mercy toward us to give us a book so that nobody needs to make John Piper their authority or Jason Meyer. We have a book, an inspired, precious, God revealed testimony of the greatest things in the universe. So, cause this people not to itch in ways that truth doesn't scratch, but rather to have desires and passions so that when the preached truth lands, it is welcomed with all their heart. And we are a worshiping people and an obedient people over the Word. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.